Hey guys, it's Jaron Wilkie with BYU Photo. Today we're going to talk about digital asset management. Now I know what you're thinking. Aren't there more interesting things to be doing right now? I could be mowing the lawn, taking out the garbage. Heck, YouTube even has way more interesting videos than this one. I think you're here because you know it's important. And anybody that creates photos and videos really needs to be an expert in digital asset management. So what is it? I think basically digital asset management is everything that happens from when you finish capturing a file to 100 years from now. It's the management of that data, how that data is going to be stored and accessible and used. So I think what we need to make sure that we remember is, is that professional photographers are the only ones that really are in charge of their data. You're the only one that cares more than anybody else about preserving that data and using it uh, to its fullest potential. In fact, if you're a photographer, you're a visual historian, and it's your job to preserve these photos and these videos for the generations. So before we jump into it, we need to just let you know that most of what we talk about comes from this book, Peter Crow's The Damn Book 3.0. This is the Bible when it comes to digital asset management. Now on his website, he has a PDF version you can download, or you can buy the softcover version. Honestly, Peter really needs to think about coming out with a pillow top version, though, because it is a snoozer. I don't recommend reading it all in one sitting. But everything you need to know for digital asset management, it's right here. I've been the digital asset manager here at BYU Photo for the past 20 years, and everything that I've learned in that time could really be summed up into three things. First of all, your photos need to be organized. Two, your photos need to be accessible. And three, your photos need to be archived. First of all, let's talk about being organized. Last year, our office shot 923,054 photos, which seems like a lot unless you consider the larger archive, which is about 20 million photos of the last 40 years. It's overwhelming unless you're organized. What do I mean by organized? Let's just say that if you got hit by a bus on the way to work tomorrow, would your coworkers be able to find and utilize your photos? Because if not, you're in a lot of trouble. Well, that and the medical bills, right? The first key of being organized is a unique file name for every single photo. Uh, back when we switched from film to digital, we made the mistake of keeping that original DSC file name because we thought it was like our negative. We realized we made a mistake when eventually people would ask for DSC 1922 and there were 83 copies of it, all different photos. So having a unique file name will make it a much easier system to organize. Here's what we do in at BYU Photo. The first two digits refer to the year that the picture was captured in, and then the second two digits refer to the month. So just by looking at this, we know it was captured in May of 2019. The next set of numbers is the shoot number. And this is just a descending list of shoots in the month of May. We know this is the 85th shoot. The last, the last set of digits are just a descending order of the photos from one to how many ever photos you have in the folder. It's a really simple system, but just by looking at a file name, we know exactly where the raw and edit files are residing on the server. The second key to being organized is metadata. All that metadata is, is a text file that's attached to your photos. And in that text file, you can attach extra information to help you organize your photos. Uh, very simply, it's your caption and it's your keywords. What, what should you put in your caption and keywords? Well, I like to just look at it like this. Who, what, when, and where. If you have that information in your metadata, it's going to be a pretty good system. Let's take a look at the metadata in one of our files. Uh, we always put at the very top of our caption field the full file name. And that's because if anybody decides to change that file, like a graphic designer, I'm looking at you graphic designers, we will always know the original file name because it's in the metadata. Secondly, we'll just put the full shoot name in there, followed by a very simple caption. This caption just states the basics. English classes at Xi'an International Studies University taught by BYU China teachers Kim and Rhonda Roper. It was captured on May 27, 2019, and the photographer was me, and here's our copyright information. In addition, we use this keyword section to add additional information about the photo that will help us in the long run. Here we're listing the college that these photos should be attached to, and also the China teacher program. Once we've finished with these files, we always put them in a consistent folder structure. Taking a look here on our server, here is that month of May. Here is the BYU China teachers. And we have our raw files all in order. And then we have JPEGs. 
It's very easy for us to go and find the raw and edited files because we always follow the same basic structure. The last thing I want to mention about being organized is that you need to make sure that you have a written down system that explains everything you're going to do and that you follow it. If you don't follow it, it's not a system. I think that especially when you have a bunch of photographers working in the same office, you all need to be on the same page, otherwise you have chaos. So now you have edited JPEGs to go along with those raw files. We need to put them somewhere that's accessible. Now you have lots of options here. You can put them on a server. You can put them on a cloud storage site. You could even get a web-based digital asset management system uh, to share those photos. I think another thing you need to consider is, is you need a way to deliver the photos to your clients, whether that's through FTP, through email, through WeTransfer, or Dropbox. The whole point is, is you want to make sure that you have a good system set up that will make it easy to transfer those files. Here at BYU Photo, we use Libris by Photo Shelter to manage our public-facing digital asset management site. It's at, if you want to check it out, it's at BYUphotos.com. On our site, we have some of our best of photos, annual events, athletic events, historic photos, and of course, stock photos, which is a really popular section of our site. Everybody on campus has access to these stock photos to use in whatever way they need to use them. We also have a section that we can store and share our edited images with our clients. So they have 24 seven access to download and access their files. And we're really happy with how robust this site is. It's keyword searchable, all that metadata can be used. If I wanted to find all the pictures with a certain building, it would take five seconds. Finally, we need to make sure that your photos are archived. In my experience, this is the most neglected phase of digital asset management because most people think, I'm fine. I've got everything on a server. What you need to understand is that every single method of storing photos is only temporary because they're hardware dependent. They will fail at some point. Over the years, I've had eight to nine hard drives completely fail on me. Now, I didn't lose any data because I had backups. In fact, it was the great John Wayne that once said, life is hard. It's harder when you don't have backup drives. Well, I mean, close enough. But what you need to understand is, is the difference between a working drive and an archive. The working drive is the drive that you use every single day. It's, it's where you look for photos and where you put your photos. The archive drive is a separate copy that you don't access. It's the long-term backup. It's the thing that should outlast you. Well, how do you do that? Here's the key. Multiple copies in multiple locations. The two most common storage methods are one, online storage, which is like a server, and two, offline storage, which is kind of more like a hard drive backup. First of all, let's talk about online storage which is essentially a server. You've heard the term RAID before. It means redundant array of independent drives. What that means is essentially if you have 10 hard drives in your server, the data is shared across those 10 hard drives. So if one of them happens to die, the other nine hard drives will have the necessary data and you won't lose anything. Now that sounds great and it works really well, but just understand it's not perfect. In fact, 10 years ago, I had a, a RAID drive go down and despite my best efforts and the efforts of the company who made it, we lost some data. Thankfully, we had another backup. Here at BYU Photo, we have a main working drive, a Synology rack mount drive with a couple expansions. So essentially, we have 110 terabytes of storage at RAID level six. Now that's our working copy. That's what we use every single day. To have a backup of that, we have an automated backup that essentially at one o'clock in the morning, any changes that were made to that server during the day are backed up to box.com, which is a cloud storage site. The great thing about that is, is we have two complete copies of our data, one here locally on a server and one backed up on a cloud site. For our offline storage, we use hard drives. Now that hard drive can be inside a computer, in an external USB drive, or just bare like this. But what you do need to remember that a hard drive is only a temporary storage device. It's not backed up automatically. It's prone to failure. Now, a lot of people are really big fans of these USB drives. I'm not. The reason is, is because I've noticed that the hard drive doesn't fail as quickly as the connection to the hard drive fails, what connects it to your computer. So I actually love using these bare drives. Uh, but in order to access the data on them, we have something we call, we call them a toaster. It's actually called a hard drive dock that you can just drop your hard drive into and get the data off of it. Now, just a word of advice. This is something I have to constantly remind my students of. Whenever you have a hard drive mounted on your computer and spinning, you should never ever move the hard drive. In fact, that's one of the major causes of failure is, is by moving the hard drive while it's spinning. Always unmount it from the computer, 
let it spin down, unplug it from the power, give it 10 or 15 seconds, then move it. And that'll make sure that your hard drive can last longer. We, with our hard drives, we always have two copies. We have what we call an access copy and an archive copy. Now the access copy stays here with us in our office if we ever need to access it. The archive copy is something that actually stays at my house. So in case there's ever a fire or a flood or whatever happens in the office, I always have a, a copy of that data backed up at my house. Let's talk about storage. Hard drives need to be stored in a safe environment. In our office, we have these anti-static cases that we keep in our filing cabinets, and they're a great way to store the drives. Now, for the portable drives, oh, I have something called a turtle. Now, this is a crush-proof case. It's also waterproof. And the great thing about it is when you look inside, it has anti-static foam with cutouts to store the hard drives. This is a wonderful way to keep your off-site copies. Now, it's a good idea to mount these drives at least one time a year and check to make sure your data is still accessible because then that gives you time to fix any errors that happen to show up. So let's recap our archive strategy here at BYU Photo. We always have four copies of the data. First of all, we have that primary working copy, which is our local server, which is a RAID. That is backed up every single night to box.com, which is our cloud storage backup. Then we have two hard drive copies. One is the access copy that lives here in the office, and then the other one is the archive copy, which lives at my house. That way, we have all of our data backed up in four ways. Now, it's great that I have four copies of this data, but I'm not done. In fact, an archive is never done. The reason is, is because that server, the, those hard drives, they're not gonna last 100 years. You always need to be on the lookout for the next format of storage, the next best way to store the data for the generations. I started doing this with CDs, and then DVDs, and then Blu-rays, and now we've transitioned to servers and to hard drives. Technology will always find a way to give you a better solution for storage, and you need to be ready to make that transition. Finally, strategy. You need to have a written out strategy, a schedule that you follow, and follow it. And if you do that, if you follow the simple things that we've talked about today, you'll sleep good at night. If you can't sleep at night, I've got a sleeping pill for you. Peter Crow's book will take care of it. Now remember, ultimately when it comes down to it, you're the one that's in charge of making your data outlast you. So get to work, happy archiving.